He's a contributor to several of our Brotherhood publications. He used to live in this area, in fact, uh, preached for the church in Louisville. And uh, during that time, served as a part-time instructor for the Preston Road School of Preaching in Dallas. Also preached in Houston, and we uh, have had the pleasure and privilege of visiting with him there and in his home. Now resides in Memphis and has consented to be on our program today. He'll be speaking to us on the subject, How Does God Limit Himself If He Is All-Powerful and All-Wise? So it's with a great deal of pleasure to present to you Brother Roger Johnson. Thank you, Eddie. And it's a delight and a pleasure to be on the program here at Fort Worth, the Brown Trail Church, to have a part in this lectureship. The contributions that you have made to the cause of Christ down through the years certainly is almost indescribable. And I'm certainly delighted that you have published the material and had these lectures that have had an impact and influence upon the Brotherhood as a whole. It's a delight to see so many in the audience who are very dear friends of mine, whom I've known through the years and have appreciated and loved extremely, and are certainly grateful for the great work which they are doing for the cause of Christ. Last August in Edmond, Oklahoma, a postal worker opened fire in a post office and killed 14 co-workers before killing himself. And during a eulogy of one of the victims of this senseless tragedy, a Catholic priest asks, Why this? Why this? To understand why this happened and to cope with it requires an unusually heroic courage. How unscrutable is God's judgment? How unsearchable His ways? Who has known the mind of God? To be sure... The ways and the thoughts of God are much higher than, than are our ways and our thoughts. But I wonder if this Catholic priest analogy as to the involvement of God and the judgment of God upon those 14 individuals who lost their lives. How inscrutable is the judgment of God? If in fact God is all powerful and God is all wise, could he not have somehow or another utilized his wisdom to have prevented the tragedy in the first place, or at least somehow or another circumvented the events that occurred on that particular occasion and used his omnipotency to prevent the tragedy from occurring. In just recent days, the tragic hotel fire in San Juan, Puerto Rico, in which some 96 individuals lost their lives and many others were injured, People perhaps began to question, why did God allow this to happen? Is God so powerless? Is God so inept as to allow such tragedies in human life to occur? Why doesn't God do something about these matters? Of course, the integrity of God is challenged by such tragedies. People began to ask, doesn't God care about innocent people who may lose their lives or experience all kinds of sufferings? Can God do nothing about human tragedies? Well, these questions have been a source of difficulty for people through the years. In his progress to conversion, Augustine encountered this hurdle. And he wrote, Could he who was omnipotent be unable to change matter wholly, so that no evil might remain in it? Indeed, why did he choose to make anything of it and not rather by the same omnipotence cause it wholly not to be? Augustine was wrestling with the same problem, the same difficulty about the omnipotence of God and the tragedies of human life and the evils and the sufferings that man experiences in life. Couldn't God have done something about the problem if indeed he is omnipotent? A man by the name of Lactantius stated the problem in this way. God either wishes to take away evils and is unable, or he is able and is unwilling, or he is neither willing nor able, or he is both willing and able. 
If he is willing and is unable, he is feeble, which is not in accordance with the character of God. If he is able and unwilling, he is envious, which is equally at variance with God. If he is neither willing nor able, he is both envious and feeble, and therefore not God. If he is both willing and able, which alone is suitable to God, from what source then are evils, or why does he not remove them? So people for many years have wrestled with the problem of the omnipotence, the omniscience of God, and the existence of human tragedies. Tragedies cause all of us to ask, can we continue to believe in an omnipotent, kind, and loving God who allows such human misery to exist? If we continue to believe in God, can we really view Him as being omnipotent, as being kind and loving? Many explanations have been shared in regard to this particular problem. Plato represented God as the cause, not of evil, but only of good. This was his theodicy. And his summary statement is this, Then God, if he be good, is not the author of all things, as the many assert, but he is the cause of a few things only, and not of most things that occur to men. For few are the goods of human life, and many are the evils. And the good is to be attributed to God alone. Of the evils, the causes are to be sought elsewhere, and not in him. And so it was that Plato, Plato sought the source of evils outside of God himself. In fact, he said there are other beings with genuine power besides God, which are the sources of evil. For example, the souls of men. Even though the souls of men are created by God, yet God gave man the power to initiate activity. And out of that power that God has granted unto man, we find the source of evil. Then he went on to say that perhaps another cause or source of evil and tragedy is the errant cause out of which God created the universe, this chaos out of which the cosmos is made. He maintained that God's power in the universe then is not absolute. Thomas Aquinas said that there is no genuine evil since nothing occurs which detracts from the perfection of the whole. In more modern times, a man by the name of Fitch viewed Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 57 and had his own views concerning the problem of the omnipotence and omniscience of God and the existence of human tragedy. Isaiah 45 and verse 57 says, I am the Lord and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. And Fitch viewed that passage, and he said that in these words, God accepts responsibility for the presence of evil in the midst of his creation. He went on to explain in his extensive discussion of the sovereignty of God that Fitch does not mean by his statement that God is the author of sin or that God would ever entice men to sin or that God would ever design for evil an absolute place in his universe. He explains that the Bible tells us that God accepts responsibility for the presence of evil in his creation and that God restricts the operation of evil in the world. And that God will always provide a way of escape from evil and cause all men to flee from evil and find in God comfort and strength. Two men, Mackey and Flew, in recent times have argued that if God had created man, these two men were atheists, and so they questioned the power of God and the creation. But they said that if God had created man, he could have made man in such a way that man would always choose the good. Mackey asked, if God can do this but does not, how can he, God, be wholly good? Anthony J. Flew says, omnipotence might have created people who would always, as a matter of fact, 
freely choose to do the right thing. According to this view, man's acts are determined then by God and he has no free will. Therefore, if there is moral evil in the world, it can be attributed to God who made and directs man. Omnipotence, he said, might have created people who would have always, as a matter of fact, freely chosen to do the right thing. Could God have created man as a free moral agent and yet at the same time created man to be incapable of choosing to do evil? If not, is that an onslaught against the omnipotence of God? Mary Baker Eddy said that really suffering is just an illusion. That it really does not occur. It's an illusion. But down through the ages, many other views have been presented as an explanation of the existence of human tragedy, of human suffering and pain and the omnipotence and the omniscience of God. Some people say, well, suffering is the result of sin. Job's admonitors offered this explanation as it relates to the tragedies that experienced in Job's own life. For example, Eliphaz in Job chapter 4 said, Remember now, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the upright destroyed? According to what I have seen, those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble harvest it. Then again in Job chapter 8, beginning with verse 11, Bildad offered this particular viewpoint. Can the papyrus grow up without marsh? Can the rushes grow without water? While it is still green and not cut down, yet it withers before any other plant. So are the paths of all who forget God, and the hope of the godless will perish. Then again in the 20th chapter of the book of Job, Zophar had his views, his pers perspective concerning this matter of the tragedies in Job's own life and why it was that these things came about. In verse 4 beginning, Do you know this from of old, from the establishment of man on earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the godless momentary? Though his loftiness reaches the heavens and his head touches the clouds, he perishes forever like his refuse. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? He flies away like a dream and they cannot find him. Even like a vision of the night, he is chased away. Job, haven't you seen this from ancient times? Haven't you seen how that, that the tragedies and the human suffering and, and all of these things experienced by man can really be attributed to the fact that man is evil, that man is sinful? Oh, yes, it may be true that for a momentary time, individuals who are wicked may prosper, but there is the end result. And so suffering is oftentimes attributed to sin. That was the explanation offered in John chapter 9 in verse 1. Whenever the disciples of Jesus came to the Lord concerning a man who was born blind, and they said, who sinned? that this man should be born blind. Did this man sin or did his parents? Well, to be sure, suffering as a result of sin explains some suffering. The individual who die, dies of cirrhosis of the liver because of the consumption of alcohol, we can understand how that this transpires. The individual who is an immoral person he contracts venereal disease or perhaps AIDS and somehow or another this is passed on to a virtuous individual. We understand how that can happen, that, that some suffering is a result of the sins of man. In Ezekiel 18 in verse 4, we learn that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And Paul remarked in Galatians 6 verses 7 and 8, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap eternal life. But we have to be honest with ourselves and understand that that does not explain all suffering. It did not explain Job's suffering. Not that Job claimed for himself 
sinlessness, but he was an upright man. In fact, the Bible described him as such in the first verse of Job chapter 1. He was blameless, upright, fearing God, turning away from evil. Why then did, did all these tragedies occur in his life? Was it because of sinfulness? Was it because he turned his back upon God? Definitely not. And how would one explain the suffering of Jesus if, in fact, all tragedy and suffering can be attributed to sin? The Bible says that Jesus knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. That he was without sin, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. And that he did no sin, 1 Peter 2 and verse 22. So, as it relates to this explanation concerning suffering, and it being attributed to sin, it doesn't, does not explain all suffering. Well, what about this problem, this difficulty? As it relates to the omnipotence, the omniscience of God, that He is all-powerful, all-wise, and yet somehow or another it seems as if He is powerless, that sin is running rampant, that there are more people that are in the camp of Satan than are in the camp of God. And there are human tragedies that we experience in life. There are heartaches. There are heartbreaks. There's physical suffering, even by innocent babies. And it seems as if God is powerless in the whole matter. I think it would be well for us to review for a moment the nature of God as portrayed in the Bible. The Bible does claim, without any shadow of a doubt, that God is omniscient in that he knows whatever is possible to know. God knows the good and the evil that man does. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding evil and good. Proverbs 15 in verse 3. God knows what is in the heart of man. All things are naked and laid open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. He is described as he who searches the heart in Romans chapter 8 in verse 27. God can know the future. He has wisdom not only about the activity of man and the thinking of man, the heart of man, but he can know the future. In Romans chapter 4 verse 17, Paul said in reference to Abraham, a statement that God made. God said concerning Abraham that he would be a father of many nations and that he caused the things which do not exist as existing. In Genesis chapter 17, verses 5 and 6, God changed the name of Abram to Abraham. For he says, I will make you the father of a multitude of nations and I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come forth from you. Well, in that sense, of course, God who knew the future, could know the future, saw as far as the descendants of Abraham are concerned, a mighty nation and kings coming from his loins. God is omniscient. But not only that, God is omnipotent. That is that God can do whatever is possible to do and will do only what is in harmony with his nature. That is the proper understanding of the concept of omnipotence, that God can do whatever is possible to be done, and that he will do only what is in harmony with his nature. In Matthew 19 and verse 26, Jesus said, With God all things are possible. The question is asked in Genesis 18 verse 14, Is anything too difficult for the Lord? And Job answered that in Job 42 and verse 2. I know that thou canst do all things. In Jeremiah 32 and verse 17, Jeremiah said, Thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and by thine outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Truly our God is able. Daniel chapter 3 verse 17. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. But not only that, he is omnibenevolent or infinitely good. 
In Matthew 19, 17, Jesus, in viewing the character of his own father, said, One there is who is good. He is omnibenevolent. He's kind. He's good. As such, he would never do anything out of harmony with his own perfect nature. He loves all good and hates all evil by loving the person who commits sin. And there is one thing that we understand about God, if the Bible be true, and it is true, and that is that God is supportive of his people. He truly cares for us, 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. And God commended his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were in opposition to God, Christ died for us. So the affirmation of the divine text, the divine scriptures, is that in fact God is omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent, all-powerful, all-knowing, and infinitely kind and good. Well, what about this matter of the nature of God and the experiences of man and the tragedies that all of us experience from time to time in our lives? We see the death of loved ones. We experience human misery in the form of cancer and other dreaded diseases. Why doesn't God intervene? Why doesn't God exercise his power? Is God really, is he really, does he really have his hands tied? Well, as we view this and as we ponder these questions, we see that God has limited his power. It is true that he is omnipotent, but God has limited his power. And the limitation of God's power is not imposed by some kind of external force. It is not the result of evil being more powerful than God. It is not that Satan has greater power than does Jehovah. But this is a self-imposed limitation. Now what do we mean by that? We mean that there are certain impossibilities that exist. Not because God is deficient in power, but because su such is not subject to power, not even infinite power. In a doctoral dissertation several years ago, Dr. Thomas Warren said, It is absurd to speak of any power, even omnipotence, being able, having the power to do what simply cannot be done. In a very excellent book that Edwin Myers wrote, he said that God's omnipotence applies to what can be done and to what is possible to accomplish, not to that which is impossible within itself. To demand that infinite power be able to do what is intrinsically impossible is to speak absurdly. God can do what is possible to be done, but because of his own nature, he will not even try to do what is impossible by definition. Men have played games with God in this matter of the omniscience and omnipotence of God. And some have ridiculed faith in God because they know the claims that the Bible makes concerning the omnipotence and the omniscience of God and yet we see all kinds of things that speak of the limitations of God. Some have even played games about the matter. You ever had the question asked, can God tie a knot that he cannot untie? If he cannot do that, then how can you say he's omnipotent? Can God create a square circle? Can God be present and absent at the same time? Can God create a mountain that he cannot climb? Can God dig a hole that he cannot fill? Men have played games with this matter of the omnipotence and omniscience of God. But there are certain things that God cannot do because he is God. In Hebrews 6 and verse 18, the Bible says that God cannot lie. He cannot lie because he is God. By the very nature of God, he cannot do that. James 1 in verse 13 affirms that God cannot be tempted with evil. That's within his nature. In Habakkuk chapter 1 in verse 13, 
It is said that God cannot countenance evil. There are some things then that God cannot do because He is God. That doesn't mean that God is not omnipotent. It just means that there are certain things that are impossible by the very nature of things. And when we view that in relationship to man, we see that God, by the very nature of the situation, could not have created a free moral agent. And yet at the same time impelled man or created him in such a way that man would always choose good. But God created man with free will. The ability to choose. And Adam and Eve had that power and they exercised that right in the Garden of Eden. Moses recognized that principle when in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. He said, I have set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life. And by the very nature of the situation in which God created man the way he is as a free moral agency. To choose evil or to choose good. To choose righteousness or unrighteousness. God has limited himself. Not by some kind of external force, but by self-imposed limitations. And out of the very nature of man's character, his free will agency, man sometimes acts carelessly, ignorantly, lustfully, irrationally, maliciously. And the price is paid. But furthermore, consider the nature of the universe itself. As we view the universe, it is characterized by uniformity and regularity. And such uniformity and regularity enables men to use matter, material things, for evil purposes. And it allows good men to use those same things for good purposes. For example, steel is used in the construction of buildings for education, for culture, and for worship. But that same material object is used uh, to construct instruments of war. Because of the uniformity and the regularity of the universe, atheistic communists are able to put spaceships to advance their domination of the world. But we find that good men can use such for the benefit of man. Fire warms man's dwellings and cooks his food, but it also burns his houses and destroys lives. God has created uniformity and regularity in the universe. And if it were not so, the world would be in chaos and in confusion. And as this uniformity and regularity is recognized by God and recognized by man, we understand that there is no respect of person in that matter of uniformity and regularity. There is no immunity from suffering for God's people as a special reward for their faithfulness and their relationship to God. Just because one is a Christian does not mean that he is automatically protected from cancer or any kind of ravaging disease. Simply due to the fact that one may be a child of God does not mean that his family is protect, protected from the invasion of death. Just last night my wife called and related a former college schoolmate of mine and uh, a preacher in the Memphis area who went out hunting yesterday, and yesterday afternoon his gun discharged and he lost his life. Because one is a child of God does not mean that he is immune from such tragedies. Just because one is a Christian does not mean that he can go down the highway with no fear of accidents occurring. You see, God is not a celestial benefactor who exempts Christians from all adversity. If it were so, men might be motivated to serve God only as a kind of cosmic insurance policy against all calamity. No, we don't have a Santa Claus God. But we have the same God 
of whom Paul spoke in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 when he was relating some of the experience in his own life. And he said, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. We have a God who has placed uniformity and regularity in the universe. And out of that, we see that some things are put to evil purposes. And there are evil results. And there are tragic results on occasion. But for the child of God, there is a God upon whom he can lean. And who gives him strength to see himself through these tragedies and through these misfortunes. It doesn't mean that God is not omnipotent and omniscient and that he is not omnibenevolent because these things occur in men's lives. Men live together. None of us liveth to himself and none dieth to himself. Romans 14 in verse 7. And it is true that oftentimes the mistakes, the sin of parents is paid for by innocent children. It is true that oftentimes the sin of drunken drivers is paid for by innocent travelers. It is also true that sometimes the sin of immorality is paid for by virtuous individuals. Living among others has its price. It has its problems. It has its difficulties. But it also has its blessings. And I suppose if we had the choice of living isolated lives or living with people, most of us would take the latter, even with all of its difficulties. Well, there is a limitation that God has placed upon himself, it is not to question his omnipotence and omniscience and omnibenevolence. But you know, out of all of that, there are certain benefits to be derived. For example, the suffering and the tragedies that we experience in life can have and oftentimes does have a remedial effect upon the life of man. Suffering awakens man to, to see his lost condition and his need for God. In the book of Psalm 119 in verse 71, David said, It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I may learn thy statutes. And the limitations that God has imposed upon himself, which has resulted oftentimes in tragedies experienced by man, builds character within man. Suffering helps to develop kindness and compassion. As we experience these things ourselves, we're able to more readily identify with other people who experience these. And it builds steadfastness in the faith. So we conclude from all of this that the existence of evil and suffering is not out of harmony with the infinite nature of God. And that in fact the experience of suffering causes men to realize the temporary nature of earthly life and to yearn for eternal life with God. In reality there is one final word to this whole story on human suffering and that would be incomplete without that word, and that word is heaven. Abraham looked for the city which hath the foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Moses counted the reproach of Christ greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt, for he looked unto the recompense of reward. And even our light affliction, which for the moment seemeth to work more and more exceedingly, worketh for us, something that is far greater than anything we can experience upon the earth. For Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1 that we know that if the earthly house of our tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We know, Paul concluded in Romans 8, 28, that all things, all things work together for good. To them that love God. It is not man's part then. To. Shake his fist in the face of God. And demand that he apologize. For putting us in a world like this. 
but rather it is to submit ourselves to him who is omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent, who exercise his power and his wisdom for the benefit and the good of man, and to place our trust, our lives, in his care and keeping, and never deny him and never fall away from him, regardless of what we may experience in the way of suffering in this world. Heaven is the final word as it relates to all of this matter.